this book hmm. is not my version this book is the truth i think it is very important for the men folk whether it's a father whether it's a husband or a son to be the protectors my father was not my protector there are times i still think that maybe you know i should have put my foot down and maybe i should have brought sheena and mikhail along with me i still cannot understand that your wife is arrested all you can think about is stopping a transfer of a flat to vidhi the same day obviously i knew there was foul play there was no doubt about it see one thing is very clearly established that sheena was definitely alive well after that alleged date of her disappearance i meet karthi, karthi. A, in uh, prison i think people also started realizing that there was some digging on going on in the inx matter now when i look back i'm convinced that somebody didn't want me to speak being from the media background myself mm. i did realize how all of this works a lot of fading stars who still believe they want to exist i think it was a moment their moment in the sun it is not easy to be in rani mukherji i can tell you are you searching for sheena i am searching for her i will find her Namaste Jai Hind you're watching ANI podcast with Smita Prakash thank you for watching or listening to this channel do like or subscribe on whichever channel you are seeing this or hearing this my guest today is an unusual choice for the podcast Indrani Mukherjee is a former media baron who spent 6 years and 8 months as an under trial in a prison in Mumbai for the alleged murder of her daughter Sheena Bora She got bail in 2022 and has now come out with a book Unbroken. Indrani and her husband Peter Mukherjee were the toast of town in Mumbai and Delhi for more than a decade. Peter was arrested in 2015 by the Central Bureau of Investigation in connection with the murder case of his stepdaughter Sheena Bora. He was charged with murder, conspiracy for murder and causing disappearance of evidence. He's out on bail since 2020. Peter and Indrani ended their 17-year-old marriage in 2019. It's not just the alleged murder of Sheena Bora that brought the couple in fimi. Indrani Mukherjee in 2018 said that former finance minister Chidambaram's son Karthi had asked Peter and her for a bribe which they paid and that led to the arrest later of Karthi and even his father P Chidambaram. The book doesn't delve too much into the INX media scam or scandal as it's called. It's more about Indrani's personal life. Let's see how much she's willing to speak about it in the podcast. Indrani, thank you so much for being part of the podcast. I've read the book. Uh, it's on the stand for viewers, those who want to buy it. Uh, uh, as you can see, I flagged quite a few uh, parts of the book. It's a disturbing read. It's uh, it's a difficult read. Um simply because of the the kind of life that you have led from small town uh, india guwahati was relatively quieter kind of a place uh, back then uh, to a slightly faster paced life in calcutta to the glitz and glamour of mumbai uh, and then uh, you go to jail for the alleged murder of your daughter you spent 6 years 6.8 years uh, for the alleged murder of your daughter awaiting the trial and then you get bail you come out and then you write this book and you're back to tv studios it's quite a life that you've led so let's begin from the beginning uh let me start off with the book i think since we are talking sure. about the book as the title itself suggests hmm. unbroken uh this title essentially uh is a description of my own spirit and which i do believe essentially is you know the spirit of every human being and the human spirit is essentially very very resilient mm. and no matter what the circumstances are if you can find your inner strength i think you can remain unbroken mm. and which is why very often we see survivors whether it's rape survivors whether it is acid attack survivors or accident survivors i think they come out much stronger so the 
this is the essence of the book that you know the inner strength is essentially our voice and a voice we need to raise whether we are women whether we are children we must not be afraid to speak up of course at the right time there yeah. is a time for everything and i think it is my time to speak so i have you've learned very early in life that there are consequences to speaking up um the the book uh, very early talks about your childhood and the trauma of being raped by your father and then being let down by the men and in i'm going to quote this part he said the three men in my life my father upendra kumar bora my son mikhail uh, my ex husband peter the people i thought i could bank upon put me through turmoil i don't feel i deserved my empathy led me to calm which i eventually which eventually offered clarity so uh, you did try to speak to your mother at that time that was that traumatic you got raped twice by your father Oh, that, that it is, is it is um, in the book so i find it really very difficult to talk about it which is the reason i have written it it's much easier to mm. write and put your thoughts down put your emotions down and it has been inside me for a very very long time mm. and this book is a closure of all the turmoil that i have gone through in my life and uh, the way i have faced it and every time i have had the strength and the courage to get up and run again and like you said it's a full cycle i am again back in the tv studios mm. so that is i think the essence of the book but yes i find it very difficult to talk about what has happened in my childhood and uh, the message going out in this book essentially is that I think child abuse is still very prevalent in cl- inside closed doors. Yeah. It happens in all families at all levels of society. Even as we speak uh, in Rani there's a case of a uh, uh, of a government official, you know, his um, uh, for having yes. raped allegedly raped a a minor. Yes. And her, his uh, wife gave abortion uh, tablets right. to this girl supposedly right. uh, we still it's not been proven as yet but that's the allegation and she's she didn't have the strength to talk to her mother uh, a mother her mother was a widow right. she didn't have the strength to talk to her mother and what happened was that she was having panic attacks and then she went to hospital and uh, there they figured out that this is what happened after speaking to her and when i was reading that in the newspaper it brought me back to your book because yeah. there were parallels that i saw that this happened and i'm going to read out a part and i'm reading out parts of the book because i don't want to speak uh, to indrani and make her relive all those experiences but i think it's necessary for people to have this conversation mothers who have daughters listen in to your children um, fathers so that your daughters can speak to you and believe those children when they come and tell you about abuse i'm going to read this out indrani I, it might be hard um you say in between st- sobs and stutters i told mom about the previous night that's the yeah. night when yeah. your father came in and raped you yeah. um when i finally looked at mom i could see that she had an unfathomable fathomable expression it was impossible to understand what she was thinking or feeling i can i can figure out that it must be hard to believe also yeah. right no woman yeah. would want to believe that of uh, of her husband because you don't mention anywhere in the book that whether she was abused um uh, by her husband whether she was beaten or there was because you do mention that he had alcoholism issues but you don't you don't talk about it so i guess for her it comes as a shock she doesn't want to believe it and then she squeezes your hand and she says i will take you to dr mason today get changed don't talk about it to anyone that's yeah. something that so many women have told their daughters don't talk about it to anyone yeah no it was a um, very very difficult moment for me uh, but as a child your emotions are uh, you know not as evolved as they are now 
And I mean, when I look back, it's still still very, very painful when I talk about it, which is why I don't talk about it. Mm. Um, but I think, you know, when I look back, I think the pain that I feel now is I think sometimes I feel I really wonder whether I find it more painful now or it was emotionally more painful then. Why? You know, I'll tell you why. Because at that point in time, uh, A, it was uh, a shock to my system. And it was very, very shocking. And the second thing was uh, I did not know how to react, really, because I did not know exactly at that point when it happened what my mother was going to do next. And in my head, obviously, as a young child, I just wanted to, you know, I never wanted to see my father again, ever in my life. And that was the kind of support perhaps I expected, not perhaps I did expect from my mother as well, mm. that, you know, she was never going to see his face again. But it, you but, were 14 then. Yeah, so that was, it was a combination as the story goes. I'm not going to talk more sure. in detail, but I'm talking about my emotions and my feelings at this point. So at that point, uh, I think as a 14-year-old, uh, at that particular moment, I did not know what the next steps were going to be. But uh, I did feel very led down eventually in the next couple of years because... I did want to stay with my mother and I did not want to be sent away or I did not, you know, it is, oh, I think for most uh, women and it happens a lot to rape survivors, uh, they are made to live with the shame though they have no control over it. That you must have done something to attract that. But your mother didn't say that. No, my mother never said that. Mm. I think my mother... It was not that my mother did not believe me. I don't think that had ever happened. Mm. Okay, so that situation never came up. But it was more of, I think, she did not have the courage to stand up and go and report. Or I think she cared, you know, about what the society would think and maybe it would all be thrown back at me. I think that could have been one of her concerns. And most importantly, I think, uh, you know, her attachment to her husband. It was a choice. I think it was a choice in between but he me raped and... But you second time then. It was a choice she made in between me and him. And people make choices sometimes others cannot understand or rationalize with. Mm. You know, it yes. happens every single day, every single day in our lives. And I think uh, that is what... I look at it as now and uh, it took me a very, very, when I left home, I did not establish contact with my family, with my parents for over 10 years because it took me that much time till they reached out. Till then, the only reason I actually established contact was because that gave me an opportunity to reconnect with my children. Mm. So that was very important for me. And when they needed me, I think I just felt it a moral obligation to be there for, you know, them. They needed me, my financial support. They needed, they were unwell. So maybe it is, you know, I don't look, I did not do it consciously to earn good karma or bad karma. It was not that. But it was that decision I took. Because a lot of people asked me this question, you know, that how could you even forgive them or go back or but it is then I would have been no different from my mother if I would have not responded to their call. You left two children with her. One was uh, Sheena yes. and one was Mikhail. Yes. And uh, Sheena was born uh, after the second uh, yes. time that. Yes. Uh, and in that you said um, when she blamed it all on me, she you say and Dr. Mason and landed up at the clinic. So and she said that Oh, she partied with her friends so, right. know, to that effect right. because she didn't want to tell Dr. Mason that it's it's her husband who did it. And then you threw, you got angry and you said that it's your husband. At that stage when I read that, I was a little confused whether uh, this is your biological father 
because you you say um, mom these people also did not need to beg that is these friends of yours yeah. of your parents yeah. Yeah. Uh, didn't need to beg their mother for help because they had been raped by their mother's husband at 14 and then again at 16 so why did you write this i mean the mother's husband why don't you say uh, that i will tell you why because uh, i do not believe hmm. honestly you know your father is which is what i had written yeah. at the beginning whether it's your father whether it's your son whether it is your husband you know the society that we live in and hmm. when there is so much of uh, uh this thing about you know we talk about the good girl syndrome that is very kind of popular now that the society expects you to be the good girl then if that is the syndrome we are meant to follow and meant to kind of live within then i think it is very important for the men folk whether it's a father whether it's a husband or a son to be the protectors my father was not my protector so i think it took me a very very long time after that to really accept or even to say he's my father it's just more of that it is more okay. of a emotional uh kind of reaction that was a reaction but at no point of time your mother said that he's not your biological father no my I mean, mother has never said it no 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 because it's really difficult uh, you know to imagine how he, demonic a man can be to do yes. this to his daughter so when i read this i was just a little confused and that's why i thought now once this happens and you have one baby and then the second baby why would you leave your children in a home where you were raped you didn't think it's an unsafe environment to leave the children smita i was 17 years old okay i had 5000 rupees in my account i did not want to leave my children mm. which i have mentioned very in book, clearly yes. in my book okay and i would have never never perhaps uh reconnected had my children not been there but I also at the same time see I have made my mistakes in life smita so I am not perfect I do not claim to be perfect I am also not the good girl that society expects me to be the good girl defined by society I have mm. led an unconventional life lot of it uh, perhaps have been wrong decisions but lot of all, it also has been circumstances that I was in So as a 17 year old or 18 year old I was neither financially nor emotionally ready because I was going through that turmoil myself and I needed to stand on my feet and I did go back when my children were barely you know 3 4 years old I did go back to your mom yeah to my mom to bring them back and she said that you've signed off uh, i have signed off and i obviously they were the custodians that was one and uh, my own children obviously didn't recognize me because i left when yeah. they were really tiny so it was not necessarily a decision that i had taken because it was a right decision or a wrong decision or a decision that i was in control of at the age of 17 and 18 i was hmm. not in control of my life or my circumstances you say that also i have somehow always had to bear the shame for things that weren't in my control absolutely and this is also you know proved i mean it is in the court records i shouldn't be talking about it but uh, yes my parents my mother did adopt them and legally i did not i could not fight a battle to get them back till they themselves wanted to reconnect and come back to me you know so it you, was that. everybody uh, bought in into that argument like your mother adopts the two children your two children um and uh, the men in your life vaporize and leave whether the father leaves and then uh, then uh, you know mikhail's father leaves and uh, and then your aunt says now this is going to be the story that they're not your children they are your yeah, siblings yeah siblings yeah and then subsequently everybody but i mean uh, gohati knew about it there were people you were 
you were obviously pregnant no in actually both, uh, in both lot cases. of people no the second of course every no people did know they knew so, so you've it gone was through it. yeah so it wasn't that see that is the mystery of it all you know because like the way a lot of people came out and claimed oh we didn't know but it's very strange that people you know in my fam it's i don't want to now get into it again i don't want to go back to the family parts of it because i am no longer bitter about it i've written everything and i was initially very upset and even yeah. i went through a whole bunch of emotions when i was left by myself and mm. people were giving out different narratives so it was not like one big secret you know it was just a more of a legal convenient situation where they were adopted and the names were there as you know sheena and mikhail and children of so and so and that continued it was just more of that the legal was that they were your siblings but it wasn't as if uh, people didn't know yeah exactly everyone in guwahati knew yeah you know my ex husbands knew about it so it was but let like, peter has gone on record peter mukherjee your uh, ex husband has gone on record to say that he didn't know about it uh, he had much, gone like, on a, record to say that but lot. he again yeah a lot after i was arrested but after that he also went in on record to say that he knew about it so now that rahul told him that his son told him yeah but when you got married but to him but uh, when you of course i did of course i did that is what i have written in my book that, and uh, but most important no you didn't tell him that uh, you had two children uh, and they were your children no when you know i have spoken about that i've written about the letter i think when huh. the letter came in and when sheena and mikhail came of course they knew huh. about it before marriage uh, yeah, yeah, you in yeah, that uh, yeah. in which you talked about wanting to bring vidhi and then you bring the uh, you bring the children uh, sheena and yes, mikhail yes yes but uh, he no he knew about it he knew, he about, knew it. about it because there was a letter that came from home hmm. and that is again a part of you know the chart sheet which yeah. i don't want to talk about the chart, chart sheet right sheet. now but and uh, there were also journalists yeah. when you were in jail who said that uh, you introduced them as your siblings and not as your children so these were journalists who worked in the news channel that is that absolutely there. correct yeah. that is absolutely it is not incorrect to say that hmm. uh because that is where you know that is how it was and there hmm. was a very clear i have explained yeah. it to you uh, uh, in, in, book, in detail yes. in the book that despite the fact when hmm. you know we reestablished contact and they came in hmm. why that status was still maintained i have yeah. explained it in the book yeah. very very thoroughly and, and very and you also talk about how difficult it was uh, with sheena where uh, you wanted to be the mother hug her and yes. she didn't know you yeah so it took she, time no it took but time. eventually we did get very close to be yeah. very honest because sheena stayed with me you know for over 3 years and uh, during that period while i was very very busy hmm. uh, also we spent a lot of time together hmm. and so that uh, i think bonding increased as time passed and um, in fact when uh, i have re- i don't know how much i have written about it i can't recall but uh you know there are several messages which have come on record where she says these are messages exchanged in between rahul and sheena mm. where she clearly tells him that i am in a very good space with my mother i am very happy with my mother so please do not interfere in my relationship with my mother mm. so that is a very kind of telling statement by itself See, it's the, probably not in the book simply because i think you ro- wrote the book in jail yes and yes. it was like uh, yeah these actually i could not i you did can't put have everything. yeah i could not include that because rahul's deposition had not happened, happened. at that okay. point so till we received a confirmation from him on huh. the stand which he did confirm that yes she not did tell him that do not interfere hmm. so up until then i did not want to really put it on record yeah. because you know at the end of the day i think uh, all the statements that have come on record itself 
explains a lot of things, which I could not include in sure, the book absolutely. at that point yeah. because the deposition was not done. You know, you t- yeah. um, all through, uh, actually it began very early where you realized that till you have financial stability yes. and you make it, uh, you know, financially independent, uh, you won't be able to get your children back. Many women uh, realize this very early in life that right. they need to be financially independent to right. take care of their children just in case things don't work out. Right. You got to learn about that in a hard way. Yeah. Uh, you had kids before you could even finish your college uh, schooling. Right. As and a minor. Yeah. As a minor. Right. And uh, then you go on to Calcutta, you take a job, uh, you make a success of your career and you keep in between, I've noticed many times you write about this, uh, and I'm going to quote from the book for viewers and listeners. Um, Indrani writes, ambition for a woman is a cardinal sin. I'm not apolog- apologetic about my chiffon saris that I apparently wore to lure powerful people. Everything from a hooker to a man-eater to a social climber to the most bizarre claim of them all, a veritable monster who killed her own daughter. Now, this is what... Um, you were called by many people. We'll get to that portion yes, later. Yes. But it's about ambition that I want to talk about because right. when you went to jail, there were these nasty uh, television debates which happened where it forget about the the murder uh, that happened or didn't happen of Sheena. Actually, that That's went a, to the background later. It, it was, was, uh, it about, was about me. Everything yeah, was about mother, me. Bad mother, ambitious yeah. woman who leaves her children. And I mean, I don't want to go into that whole yeah, thing. Yeah. But it was a lot about ambition. Yeah. Um, when did you realize ambition, not a bad word, financial stability important? It's there in the book. But then yes. those who haven't read the book, I'd like you yes. to tell me. Okay. Uh, you know, I must be very honest with you, Smita. That when I left Guwahati, and on hindsight today, sometimes there are times I still think that maybe, you know, I should have put my foot down and maybe I should have brought Sheena and Mikhail along with me, even though I was very young. But I'll tell you something, if I would have stayed back in Guwahati, I think I would have killed myself. I would have, because I could not deal with what was going on with me anymore i could not deal with further abuse so whether it is a question of that did i put myself as a human being before my children at that point when i was 17 and i was undergoing constant abuse okay did i fend for myself before them is a very debatable question okay okay and i'm being very honest because I don't want to say that I am perfect because I am not perfect. I know other people might be people who make judgments and have great opinions about me, may be perfect, but I am not. Okay, So I have made my share of mistakes and sometimes on hindsight I think about it, that maybe I should have brought them or maybe I should have endured the abuse and continued to stay back there for my children. Maybe that would have made a lot of people think I was the, you know, that good girl, I fit into that good girl syndrome, okay, or I would have been a good mother or whatever. But what I feel that there were there was a combination of two things when I had left home. One was I couldn't deal with the abuse anymore. B, I also knew that if I needed to take care of my children and give them a better life that they deserve and I'm not talking about financial just financial that I need to be able to get a hold of my own financial stability as well as my own emotional stability Hmm. which I definitely could not do staying under the same roof as my father and because your father had been asked to leave but he was returning returning that was up until then I stayed you stayed I stayed I stayed with the children and I studied and I worked very hard and I was a good student despite everything else you know everything that happened around me I continued to take care of my children but the reality is that as an 18 year old I was not financially capable to take care of them on my own without financial support from someone. Uh, Yes, so at that very early age also, I did realize that I was not the regular girl, next door girl. I was never just 
a regular girl that i knew from day one that i had a strength perhaps which probably i recognized and perhaps other people couldn't see it and that was the drive that i had within myself that i knew i would get out and that you know if i get out of guwahati was the only time i would be in a position to give the best to my own children hmm. that was something i was very sure of the second thing that i was very sure of was that you know if i had the ability and the capabilities hmm. i would not let anything come in the way of my ambition and when i'm saying anything means that i would not allow society to tell me that this is a particular way i need to behave because it is not right for a woman to be ambitious so yeah. that was something i had made up my mind at a very very early age that i was going to succeed and Which, i was uh, going to make a life of myself and i was going to put into use the education that i had and i was going to work hard i am a, i have always been a very very hard working woman and i still continue to be so when you come to bombay i'm going to skip the calcutta yes. part yes. which you tried domesticity to a large extent and then you go to again to jamshedpur if i'm not mistaken yes. right yes. and you try to be the good housewife and it doesn't work because But it's not me it's not you and your yeah. the um, la- lack of ambition in your husband unable to bear the uh, the the knocks that he's getting frustrate you and you want to yeah. move out and do right. something on your right. own so you come to bombay and uh, you you branch out and there uh, you meet peter and it's quite obvious that he's smitten by you but you don't find anything um, very fascinating about him other than the fact that he's a good successful so even though you get married it's quite clear that there is this lack of chemistry at least because everything else in the book you speak with such Passion. warmth and passion whereas this is a marriage which seems like two professionals getting into an arrangement i'm sorry if i sound a little harsh in saying that but it seemed like uh, you he was putting you down right from the word go and he was he was admiring you as a good looking person but at the same time yes threatened by you. i uh, again i don't want to since i have uh, written so much already in my book but i think uh, what really uh, started bothering me after a point in time um is that i needed to be appreciated as a person hmm. by my husband and not just a good looking woman you know forget about the career side of it so i still remember uh, this one conversation which i have not actually written in my book but it is going to be perhaps i should tell you because i have just remembered as we were mm. speaking and you've actually hit the nail on the head that it was i think just that undermining that which got me actually more riled up i think uh i remember there was a conversation that we were having where uh actually peter had said that i do not even fall in the 1% of the population of india i mean he was talking about himself so it was something so basically he was telling me that you don't understand who i am hmm. but it is just you know all these things are all ups and downs in life so we all have ups and downs in life but again uh, uh i think there is a side uh to this whole thing to our marriage to our relationship to the people we are that uh, the outside world does not necessarily see sure. that i have seen the reason i'm going into your marriage i mean in uh, yeah. it, it's not as if i want to invade your privacy but there is the my life is an open book isn't? and in the real sense now it yeah. is a book so it has been you know narrated in different ways sure but 
I didn't, uh, you know, uh, uh, Indrani, in all those uh, TV debates or whatever, I didn't write or report on any of that. I, I know I, that. I'm aware of that. Yeah, and so which is I why, didn't. and thank you so much for that. Because I didn't. Because I didn't know you and I didn't yes. know about the case. So I yes. didn't talk thank about that. Thank you so that. much for that. So, But I still want to know why was it, you know, I'm going to read out some of these portions which you, these were people, Bombay socialites or I don't know what you want to call them, but they were the people who were on TV screens at that time. So there's uh, this Queenie who said that, uh, you know, she's lived in South Bombay and she had, you know, she, she spoke to you that she spoke about you that you were an outsider. Bombay is known for outsiders who made it. So it's not as if every all these people were born in Bombay. Then there was, you know, the word ambitious keeps coming yes. in all those TV debates. I saw a whole bunch of them all over again. Then um, V. Sangvi said that uh, she had delusions of grandeur and was obsessed about being a media baron, uh, which I would think again, from Murdoch it onwards... Translates to being ambitious. Uh, right? Yeah. <laughs> so, um, so then there was Tavleen Singh who said, uh, who also said on Karan Thapar's show that she comes across as the most heartless woman. Uh, and she never explained why I'm the heartless woman, but anyway. Uh, in, in another interview I saw where she said that uh, that once you are a mother, then every other role goes to the side or something to that effect. Uh, then there was Rishi Kapoor, who, who you mention again. But these are just some of them. There were many more that who came yeah. on TV debates. Uh, you didn't uh, s speak about all that because you could have listed them. <laughs> there were like I could have listed in my book would not have been then 400 pages. I think it would have been 4,000 pages. So, yeah. yeah. But the, that, that would have made uh, for a magazine article rather than a publisher's book. Uh, yeah, think. absolutely. Uh, but you, you didn't see all this because you were in jail. Yes, that's correct. In fact, I was on and off uh, informed by my lawyers about these things. But uh, so I would kind of find out or when I'm in court, if I'm watching something. But, uh, you know, this information was coming to me. It wasn't that I never knew about it. And occasionally, I would, uh, you know, see it on television. I would but see then these. in jail, they would make they sure. They would, yeah, because they wouldn't like me to get upset. Because to be very fair, I think uh, the jail, whether they were the officers or they were the prisoners, they became my family and my protectors at jail that point. Jail ki ladli is what you were yes, called. Yes, yes. And they were very, very good to me. And I must admit that, and I have said it again and again. I think I survived and I stayed unbroken because of them. Hmm. And it's a fact. You know, so uh, they were very protective, but there were times I would still suddenly put on the TV and I'd see things, right? Hmm. But my lawyers, to be very fair, kept me informed about these conversations. And there were times I would uh, kind of feel, uh, initially I used to be a bit upset. Hmm. But then after that, again, being from the media background myself, hmm. I did realize how all of this works. And uh, I think for a lot of people, particularly a lot of fading stars who still believe they want to exist, I think it was a moment, their moment in the sun. And all these people who have spoken about me, I think I don't want to talk about their lives because their lives are of no interest to me. Half of them I don't know. But like you rightly said, you said something very important, you know, for example, again, I don't want to kind of, you know, dignify all these <laughs> stupid comments, but uh, a lot of them are outsiders themselves. A lot of people have gone. I can put my hand on my heart and say that I may have been married more than once, but I have never, never broken a home because I have never been responsible ever for the breakup of a marriage. I have never dated a married man. I have never dated anybody who's been in a relationship or, you know, broken marriages to get married. Mm. So I can say that with authority. And so I, I really haven't hurt anyone. But a lot of these people uh, who have gone out and spoken have done these kind of things. Okay, so, mm. so I think people who live in glass houses should not throw stones. I think they live in more fragile glass houses than I do. So I think they should just, I think, watch their mouths before they speak because when you have 
so many skeletons in your own cupboard you should not talk about other people and i think people have a lot of time to talk about me you know so that is okay. one thing which is i think uh, very but you know you you realize that yeah. here you are a media baron yeah. and then the scandal breaks out and then you know there's a body of course It and then be, you know about the body what about, happened yeah. right about the so dna expert it's there in the book so those so, who haven't yet read the book just yes. uh, if you could just uh, briefly tell us that when you know because th- that that whole thing about yeah. when the body came that you were shocked because you couldn't believe initially I mean, there, yes. there's almost a whole chapter where you are unable to come to terms that sheena is, is dead is not alive yes. anymore yes absolutely mm. so it took me a see that is something people don't want to uh probably can't relate to or don't consciously want to relate to that there is a grieving mother inside when they talk about a good mother and a bad mother that is the grief they don't see you know mm. so the thing here is initially when we received the charge sheet and i saw the reports obviously i did not you know i did not understand what a dna report looks like but i do recollect uh, very very clearly that when uh, sudeep pasbola who was my trial lawyer at that point he just asked me one simple question when he met me you know which is very interesting that i need to know that as a law- as your lawyer it's i am going to defend you i need to know one thing are you guilty or not guilty of And murder Obviously. or conspiracy or hiding or anything anything okay. anything connected to this case you hmm. need to tell me that because if you tell me that you are guilty and this is very because i have not written in detail in about it in the book but hmm. i will still talk about it then i will decide on how much to ask for but if you are telling me you are innocent then i am going to take out every single piece of evidence that has not been produced here because i am going to prove that all of this is all bogus and which is exactly what he did because then he told me he said you know a dna report is not one sheet of paper you need to understand that there is a full process of documentation and there is a raw data that comes before this and which is in the form of an electroferogram it's like a cardiogram okay so which basically when you put in any sample whether it's a blood sample or a bone sample so the machine automatically you know starts printing the machine prints it hmm. prints that cardio uh, the electroferogram like how we have it in the cardiogram hmm. right that electroferogram where it takes the uh, peaks of uh, the allele numbers and that can only be machine printed so when we asked for the data finally just before the dna expert who was mr lade he came uh, to testify we asked for the raw data and uh, that was the point uh, you know my lawyer said that we are going to win this hmm. because when we saw the raw data and we saw those electroferograms each and every i mean a large portion of the electroferograms the numbers were cut out the machine printed numbers were cut out and changed to match my blood sample and and this is not there in the book yeah that is why yeah. i'm elaborating on it right now because wow. now this thing is in an open court my trial is in an open court and people report only as much as they want to yeah. report right so which is convenient and which It's also creates what you're saying yes yeah. and so mr lade who is the dna expert actually admitted because uh, my defense our defense lawyers confronted him with the electroferogram and said isn't this supposed to be only machine printed he said yes and then after that they said but there are you know handwritten changes here to the numbers and then he said that i have changed it so and from that i finally the the hmm. report was that one sheet of paper was attached to that besides the dna there's also the forensics uh, that you talk about in great detail about that you know the the skull and 
these are two things which come up and then the sighting of Sheena. Are those three things the ma a major reason or three major reasons why the judge probably gave you bail? Uh, see, I, will t I am not going to talk about uh, the decisions of the court sure. right now because the matter is sub judice. So I don't want to talk about the decisions. But what I can talk about is the evidence that has already come on record because it's the trial is in an open court. Hmm. But whatever has come on record, sure. I can talk about that, which okay. is it's already been reported, Fine. you know, in thousands of pages hmm. by several people. Some concocted it, some very few people reported facts. But anyway, but uh, OK, so and these I know it's, uh, you know, this is here we are talking about my daughter. OK, so it is not very easy. But having been involved in this case, for me, I think talking about skulls and bones and DNA yeah. and all of that has almost become a part of my life because it is important. For me, the essential thing is obviously, first part was to find out whether, you forget about the allegations on me, that is the least of the hmm. concerns at this point. I needed to find out whether that body really belonged to Sheena. That is very, very, that was important for me because I needed to know whether she was alive or not. That was the most important kind of driving force for me because hmm. somehow, somewhere, I still couldn't believe it at the back of my mind. So the DNA, of course, the moment the DNA expert came and admitted and in fact, when he was testifying at that point, he was already, he was already uh, suspended for again, not for one kind of this thing, for two other cases where he had done something very similar. He was already suspended. Hmm. So those are the kind of people we rely upon for reports anyway. Uh, but uh, the forensics. The yeah, forensics. Yeah. This I'm talking about the DNA. DNA. Now hmm. coming back to... So when we had received the charge sheet, the postmortem report, so in this entire case, there are also two bodies. Now, allegedly for one murder, there are two. It is almost like if this doesn't work out, we will talk about the other one. It is almost, I've never heard or heard of. Now I've done a lot of studying of several cases mm. over a period of time. So I've never seen or heard about anything like this in my life, except for my own case. So... Apparently, in 2012, this is as per the statement, uh, as per the case, that is the crux of the case, that uh, in uh, 2012 May, apparently, which of course they state in 2015, somewhere in uh, a part of Maharashtra, in a remote part of Maharashtra, a body was found and that body, a post-mortem was done on that body. And a postmortem report was prepared by a doctor, Sanjay Thakur, who's, uh, who works with the government. Hmm. He's from a government hospital. And as per that postmortem report, which is a part of the charge sheet, it says very clearly, no brain matter. So obviously, when he came to depose, uh, the defense lawyers had asked at that point that how did you check? whether there was brain matter or no. So he volunteered this information, saying that uh, I had used a saw to make a circular cut on the skull. I cut open the skull and removed the skull cap and then saw that there was no brain matter, right? That means so, the body had been rotting and that's why this brain matter goes. How does a brain no, matter no, go? No, no, you forget about that part of it okay, okay? that right. is of no relevance at this point in okay. time all right okay so this is we are talking with the skull now of course as per the charge sheet that same body hmm. you know was supposed to be allegedly supposed to Sheena's. be my daughter's body right hmm. Uh, of course, also there was no DNA test done on that body. So I don't know how they came to that conclusion on that particular body. There was in no 2012. In 2012. But anyway, so their claim was that 
that body which was found in 2012 is the same skeleton that they brought and presented in court. But what they did was they came and presented a skull which is intact. There is not even a single mark on the skull. So, and which has been confirmed. We've all seen it, okay, that skull that they presented, confirmed by the head of forensics from Nair Hospital, also by the head of forensics from Ames. They have confirmed that the skull that has been produced is an intact skull. So, how does a skull that has been cut open with a saw become an intact skull three years later. Correct? Is that when you had inkling that... I, was, I did not have an inkling. I was convinced. Okay. I was convinced. Obviously, I knew there was foul play. There was no doubt about it. That was never a doubt in my mind. So, this thing, in fact, came out even before the DNA thing, right? So, I mean, that obviously gave me, you know, reasons to believe. And then came the uh, DFSL messages, which were retrieved from Rahul Mukherjee's phone, right? And those are not retrieved from somebody else's phone. It's his phone. He had given the phone. The messages were out from his phone. And those have been, again, forensically taken out by DFSL. It's DFSL certified, where... It establishes that even well after, like there are very intimate conversations in that, well after that alleged date of her disappearance, Sheena's disappearance, there was there were a lot of communications to the extent like, okay, I'm waiting downstairs, you come down, I go up, okay, I'm coming to pick you up, and it continues. So one day there can be a mistake. It cannot be a continuous series of So there of are many mistakes. people at that time who were reporting and said that the phone was, Sheena's phone was probably that with you was, and you were... Uh, correct. That was, was their statement was then. But are you trying to tell me that a person is continuing to pick up that person, whoever is carrying on the carrying the phone, let's say whether it is XYZ carrying Sheena's phone. So who is he picking up every day? Who is he collecting every day? Who is he having food with? So there are messages to that extent which continue for a period of two weeks continuously where they are ordering for food. I am sitting downstairs. You come down. You come up. Okay, so let's kind of five minutes. And there's a pat. So are you trying to tell me that Rahul has had this conversation with her spirit every single day and collecting her from wherever she was working and ordering food? So who was he doing all this with? Every so single also, day. Every single day. And he also reports uh, Sheena missing. No, he does not. That and is a lie. He does not report her missing anywhere. And that he has admitted that he has not filed any complaint anywhere and prosecution despite his earlier claims oh i went out there is no police station which has anything to establish that ever rahul mukherjee went anywhere to file a missing complaint there is no record of in fact i was the only one who approached the police when she was missing and in fact, there are tapes on record which establish where I am telling Rahul, I will go with you to the police station. He tapes doesn't show up. Phone tapes. Yeah, phone tapes, which have been retrieved from his phone, hmm. where I have said that I will go with you to the police station. But he never comes. And when I'm in Bombay, he just doesn't show up. I called him to the house, let's go. But he doesn't, and it's all on record. And again, let me also reiterate this. Also, and which is where, I mean, you know, not that I'm very happy with a lot of things that were said, you know, in debates at that point. But there was something which was pointed out. I don't want to name the anchor, hmm. but by one of the anchors, you know, while I was in prison. And uh, I think that, you know, this entire story about... Uh, 
you know nobody knew there is a full conversation on tape that is happening where you know i am referring to sheena peters in that conversation rahul is in that conversation all of us are referring to sheena as my daughter all of us so where is this entire thing coming from that nobody knew about it and that is on record nobody knew that sheena is your daughter that's yeah. what you mean when yeah. i'm saying nobody yeah. here i'm implying peter yeah. peter right so there is a full conversation so he doesn't sound shocked there or he's not i mean there is a he is saying it i'm saying it rahul is saying it it's an open conversation no, peter did say that sheena told him that uh, that she is the biological daughter but that he said much later much later, right so yeah. initially when i was arrested i have seen those in which he says he didn't know he said i am in a state of shock i am shocked to hear that yeah you know i shouldn't be venting now but it's <laughs> <laughs> i should but really yeah you are having a full blown conversation about you know it is all right after all she's just gone with the mother and then 3 years later you just turn around and you say on television you were clueless so really? there's a whole conspiracy no uh, uh so uh, you know there there are so many open ends out here and there was also that whole you know today i decided smita sorry for that i was not going to talk about peter and i don't want you to ask me anything about peter anymore okay. because it just yeah you know just uh unnecessarily kind of gets me again emotionally kind of into a bit of a turmoil because it just i i don't want to you know he is my past and this book is a closure i do feel uh, very sad about the fact that i should not have been abandoned the way i was and 17 years of marriage 17 years of marriage and i think and somebody said it's a quickie divorce that also happened well But it was a quickie divorce because i think i did not want to waste 10 years of my life fighting for a uh, maintenance and properties and, and a lot of women through, do that so. all through you keep talking about how financially uh, you were fine you were uh, Absolutely. At, at one point of time you mentioned some 60 uh, jewelry sets or something 6 crores uh, that peter has transferred to uh, of yours which yes. peter has transferred you said uh, i'm going to read that out and i'm yes. reading out these portions so that you guys those who want to buy the book uh, will know that you know There are certain facts which didn't get reported. The years from 2015 to 2019 were traumatic for me. The understanding was that she wasn't there anymore. There was a body, rather a skeleton, that matched my DNA, thus leading to the deduction it was Sheena's. I was in my 30s. We decided to go live in England. I was 37 years old. I gave up everything to make him happy. I lived my life to suit his desires, his needs. I could have stayed back, got a job in a corporate company, and then. uh indrani goes on to say and a third i was fi- left financially unstable and access to my funds was taken away by then i had mustered courage to fight my battles from my account 6 crores were moved to peter's son's accounts that is correct and uh, and then you also talk about jewelry sets several jewelry sets which it was uh, which were you supposed to go to your daughter almost 70 sets of jewelry when i'm talking about uh sets i mean sets you know so it's not pieces necklace of earrings bracelets everything, everything together and yeah okay a lot of it i mean almost all of it is my ancestral jewelry which has come from both sides and i've written about it yes. and there is a full panchnama you know memorandum when uh, the court finally passed an order to say that the jewelry has to be returned to her so this was a court direction and peter was in prison i was in prison and the cbi escorted us where there was this we had to go through this entire procedure where he had to finally return all of that to me so it was kept for my children so i you know what i so it is not really you forget the jewelry forget everything you know what really no, that's cross of me yeah that's cross but it is not so much the cross you know what really Uh, I still cannot understand and I do not have an answer to it as of now that your wife is arrested all you can think about is stopping a transfer of a flat to Vidhi the same day 
the day of the arrest is that really you think about transferring funds from my account you write to me saying that i don't have money to pay for lawyers so you need to wherever i don't have access into your accounts you need to give me access and you transfer 6 crores you move you go around moving jewelry and you don't make my children my children a party to those lockers and to accounts you make your sons a party hmm. to those you know accounts and to those lockers so and you, that you, you is write, what is yeah, really okay. very very upsetting because i would have really understood if at that point peter would have done all of that in joint names with let us say he's very angry with me and he doesn't want me to have anything that if vidhi was a part of it if vidhi mikhail his sons everybody was made a joint holder in mm. that in those lockers and accounts i would have understood you know uh, you keep writing about this that you you initially start signing the checks or whatever yeah. because you believe that you both are in jail peter's in jail right. you're in jail and you're fighting this case as a couple couple correct but correct. It, it strikes you at some point of time that he has abandoned and he's fighting a separate battle and did he at some point of time think that you're responsible and you have killed sheena see that is not what he has told me to be huh. very honest okay because uh, when i met him in court i had asked him this question and straight on that tell me something do you somewhere at the back of your mind did you ever? he said no absolutely not and he said that i have always continued to maintain which i don't know but i think the impression he gave outside was very different anyway mm. but uh, mm, he said that i have always told everyone that indrani is absolutely clueless that is what he has told me and mm. perhaps if you ever interview him you can ask him this question but he has told me this that i have told the cbi i have told everybody indrani is absolutely indrani cannot give directions or take old goa road and she's clueless about if you turn her around here she wouldn't know how to come back home and which is a fact you and know the you have you had also left shamvar yeah, that you yeah, told he was an older yeah guy older guy so i mean where all these stories have come but now in hindsight you know smita when i think back i do believe uh, that somebody definitely wanted me to go to prison that is a given because you know sometimes you think that uh, you don't have enemies but clearly i do because everybody came out claws and daggers the moment i went into prison so i didn't even who? like is it is it a business rivalry would you think because personally you didn't seem to have any rivals no i didn't but that. very clearly everyone but came out and uh, a lot of people had to say a lot of nasty things about but me but not right? uh, yeah but those are like the you know society yeah, bitching, kind, bitching of kind of thing yeah, yeah. yeah but not enough to implicate you in a murder yes, that yes. also of your own daughter right. unless there was some financial did you did you lose a lot of money at the end of it other than fighting legal battle like because there was this there was also mm. this whole talk that there were hundreds of crores oh, kept in some money and sheena probably was uh, was sheena had that had one lakh in her account which after all the investigations that came out like a 23 year old would have right so those are stories stories and stories and because obviously nobody has been able to really come out with a real motive there has to be a motive so you know i don't think this whole story of oh they were against the relationship is really going to fly it yeah doesn't. that was also there that you were yeah, against so rahul that and she, which is also really somehow which you have said in the book that wouldn't you have killed rahul yeah then? exactly i mean why do i and they were living together for over 3 years so one fine morning why would anybody decide to just wake up and say okay we don't want this relationship anymore so that's a bit odd right mm. and it was not like they were in hiding right they were openly living together openly. Mm. so it's just somehow you know it, it wasn't just, adding up it just was it still doesn't add still, up <laughs> okay. yeah, still let me get on yeah, to but, the but but coming back to since we were talking about the mm. sighting the sighting mm. of uh, sheena's thing i need i lost track of yeah. uh, things while i just got a bit emotional 
but uh, yes now let me also um, put it on record that a lot of people have uh, put out reports saying that i have claimed sheena is alive so i have a i want to put it on record i have never claimed that sheena is alive or that i have seen sheena because i have neither seen sheena nor met her so this is not my claim yes however having said and done there are people who have made these claims not only have they made these claims a very reputed lawyer, lawyer has taken her colleague has taken who's another lawyer has taken a video footage and the honorable court has also got the cctv footage which is now kept in a sealed envelope in court so obviously these decisions have been taken after the video has been perused right so mm. there is a reason why the honorable court also perhaps has allowed that cctv footage to come in mm. because clearly because of the forensics that point in the direction very clearly that there is a very strong possibility of sheena being alive mm. and there is an affidavit to that effect so nobody needs to and the other person who had apparently met sheena happens to be a police officer from the crime branch so all these people i mean that person doesn't know me so why would anyone go out of their way or put their neck on line for something like this so is, you know mothers and daughters have complicated yeah. relationships and there are n number of mothers and daughters who've had estrangement or whatever reason right. love affairs right. or money or right. or property or whatever it could be right? anything. anything yeah it's so you not not being in touch with sheena understandable with with right. the kind of life that both of you have led right. and the trauma that right. involved her birth and her bringing up that fine but after if sheena was alive and she mm. saw what was happening why would she not get in touch with you indrani see that is uh, one thing i honestly don't have an answer to and it is rather baffling that why would she continue to hide and she's hiding in plain sight if she's around right if she is spotted at an airport or in if Guwahati. she is yeah or if she's spotted let's say in kashmir in kashmir yeah yeah you know these are the two places that have been uh, named see one thing is very clearly established that sheena was definitely alive well after that alleged date of her disappearance okay that is established already that is not it is also established that that 2012 whatever obviously mm. body cannot be hers because mm. you know they have come back with a different skull so mm. it cannot be mm. that if it is the same this thing so these things have been established however i cannot understand that why would somebody continue to hide like this knowing that her mother is has been in jail for so many years and is still you know doing everything possible to find her why would she continue to hide until and unless there is something much much bigger to this whole thing you know which i i really but everybody believes like mikhail didn't hunt for her when she was missing see that is what kind of really gets me now there is for example you know and there are no answers to these things you know now apparently on the 24th after that as per rahul claims that you know he has not met sheena after that but the whole of 26th of april the entire day he spends with the driver shamvar rai so isn't it very odd that he does not ask the driver the entire day where is she now where did you drop her and nobody that day of 26th i was not in bombay is not mentioned nobody talks a word about 26th the 26th of april is a very important day because that enter and these are really very very funny situations because the driver doesn't talk about meeting him till he was grilled that you actually spend the entire day with rahul didn't you hmm. and rahul doesn't talk about it anywhere in his statement till he was probed 
and then he continued denying it. That's the day it. the body is found. No, 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 no. What is what happened on twenty sixth April? See, as per his claim, huh. he was running around trying to file police reports. Ah, okay. But the whole of twenty sixth, he spends the entire day with Peter and Shamvar Rai. Hmm. So why would you not? Peter is an influential guy. He knows all the police, cops, everyone. Why would you not just go with your father to file a police complaint? A, B, would you even not? You knew very well that, as per his own claim, he saw Sheena with the driver. He claims that, right? So you don't ask the driver where he dropped her, or what happened. Hmm. Do you not find it very odd that hmm. a day after the disappearance, you spend the entire day with the driver, but you don't ask the driver where is she? And right in the beginning, you're told by this top cop, yeah, that admit to it, otherwise you'll you'll be hanged. In. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And he, and he then goes out of the equation, right? At some point of time, right? You know, in this, um, I'm going to come now that we've spoken so much. Let me come to your career. Uh, you set up INX um, and uh, this this business in which Peter decides to become a part of it. Right. Uh, and then now th that also runs into trouble. Uh, investors come in; it doesn't work, and then. The whole thing about you writing to Arun Jaitley, who's the finance minister, and you turn approver in this case. And uh, I'm going to quote in this in which she said, Peter and I had gone to meet P. Chidambaram, who was then the finance minister, and a deal had been struck. Some say, uh, some, I quote, I scratch your back, you scratch mine, unquote. Money was given to Karthi, uh, Chidambaram's son, and the company. Now, there's this whole thing about lakhs which were given to him, which is a separate news report which came in. Mm -hmm. The CBI is quoted in that. That's separate. In your book, you don't mention the amount which Karthi. Now, he, this happens and that becomes another thing. Karthi gets arrested. Chidambaram gets arrested. Uh, you are in jail when all this is happening. That's correct. You get to know about all this that you have because of what happened at that time. So what's going on in your mind at that time when you now you're in a political mess too? No, I think uh, that political mess, now on hindsight, see, this is a realization for me. Mm. And uh, it took me a long time to realize it. And uh, particularly uh, when I came out of prison. And I realize it even now. Mm. Okay. So particularly after writing this book, it is again, so this is not really ended. I don't think it has ended as yet. These conversations really started because at the back of my mind, uh, I somehow, you know, there is something called the woman's intuition. If mm. you believe in it, I do believe. But uh, I was having these conversations with Peter for a very, very long time. You know, that I think at some point or the other, we need to come out with this, you mm. know, because it is going to come to bite us. At some point, and it did. Hmm. So, uh, when the government changed, which was in 2014, 14, I think towards the end, I don't, I was Me. in England. Yeah, no. I'd moved to England several years prior to that. I think in 2009, I moved to England. So, yeah, I think me. The uh, company had gone under. Yeah, yeah. That was like there was this whole economic meltdown, global meltdown, and, mm. you know, there was no funds coming in. No, I'm talking about 2014. So that was the point uh, I did have a chat with Peter. And the frequency of those conversations became more and more because somehow, somewhere I felt that, you know, I think it is best that now the government has changed. We can go and report and this. And he said, let know? sleeping dogs lie. Lie. I have also mentioned that. That's exactly Right, what that's said, exactly. Yeah. And that's very Peter way of talking. Mm. So, and also I think to be very fair to him also, nobody wants to get into all this mess. You know, we've mm. never been to, at least I've never been to a police station in my life before this. I've never had to meet lawyers apart from the divorce that I had with Sanjeev. I've never met a lawyer in my life till mm. then. So, uh, for any other reasons, you know, mm. for any criminal issues or frauds or whatever. But uh, as the conversations, uh, you know, started increasing more and more, I think it also 
there was a level of i think discomfort that started happening in our kind of own relationships you know so that is something on hindsight i realize it and then the know? cbi officers come to you and no now that is i'm talking about still 2014 yeah. and then 15 we are now moving to 2015 and 4 uh, 5 months later i am arrested and as you are aware i don't know if you are aware the case was not a cbi case hmm. the case was uh, you know uh, under inx enforcement no, directorate no 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 i'm talking my oh sheena's case sheena's case was okay uh, mumbai police mumbai police and it was headed by uh, rakesh, rakesh maria hmm. i am absolutely now when i look back i'm convinced that somebody didn't want me to speak and i was obviously put behind bars clearly because of that and it was I I mean realize who did it I cannot say because without evidence you know I can't really say this but somebody did not want me to speak that is a given and I think uh, at that point I didn't think it was connected perhaps to this case or you know I I think people also started realizing that there was some digging on going on in the INX matter people with information would know all of this and there were only two people who could speak about it right one was peter and the other was me hmm. right so uh, and uh, but for that these two cases to be interlinked uh, sheena would have to be party to that otherwise See, it was she it who was missing it is it is uh, no it is sometimes i think it's a bit far fetched sometimes i think that you know i i really honestly smita i don't know hmm. but all of this was not a coincidence trust me even my arrest i have written about that my arrest a day before my younger daughter's 18th birthday is not a coincidence because the next day for example uh, on the 26th of august 2000 15 a day before i was arrested this entire property you know which was supposed to be transferred to vidhi and then a stay was put to it by peter the moment i was there i was arrested a day before hmm. her 18th birthday so that was it is very apparent that you know it was done to stop that and it's not as if and they were in uh, poverty because you do mention about but greed about is there is no measure of greed and when you are greedy there is no it's a pitless kind of you know because you do mention that all the children were taken care of one son was yes, given a house yes. in england another son any was another but place but that that place that was supposed to go to vidhi was ultimately moved to his son right the marlo yes, apartment yes yes that's what happened and mm. uh, also like for example i mentioned this that mm. why would you want to move all my jewelry to your sons that's mm. a bit odd when it's my ancestral jewelry why not give it to me khail why not give it to vidhi you know let us assume for that one moment that she now is not around why not them mikhail was an adult so what happened hmm. so in why was he not included in that you know uh, when so, you the cbi comes to you yeah. uh, you say i requested to meet the head of cbi that time alok verma was cbi director that's correct and rakesh astana was hmm. the special cbi director uh, cbi central bureau for investigation for uh, overseas viewers and listeners just to explain that hmm. and at that time there was this tussle going on between mr astana and uh, alok verma so there were fissures in the uh, central bureau of investigation in may 2014 The investigative wing or the Central Bureau of Direct Taxes compiled a tax history of the INX group and suggested that the Mukherjees had laundered 275.5 crore rupees via Mauritius into eight INX group subsidiary companies between 2007 and 2008. Another newspaper report of 2018 says that Indrani Mukherjee had told CBI that one million dollar deal had been struck between Karthi Chidambaram and the Mukherjees to secure FIPB approval in favor of INX Media. 
In October 2018, the Enforcement Directorate seized assets of Karthi Chidambaram worth 54 crore rupees, including properties in New Delhi, Karnataka, Uti, UK, Spain, in relation to the INX media case. Karthi and his father call it political vendetta. You say that days after the statement was recorded, uh, Karthi Chidambaram was arrested, and you meet with them in court, don't you? So. Uh, no, I meet Karthi, Karthi. A, in uh, prison. In prison. Yes, that yeah. is correct. Yeah. So, uh, at that time, did you suspect anything that there was a plot, there was a conspiracy? No, it was more of my conversations with Peter over a period of time hmm. that led me to understand and believe very strongly, and I have also written it very openly in my book that he knew about my arrest because Peter was the only person who knew that day where i was going nobody else knew about it so which day uh, on the day of my arrest hmm. even my driver didn't know where i was going so it's all very i mean that is one part of it and over a period of time the conversations that i was having with peter because even during that period i was under a lot of pressure uh you know not to come out with the truth i was under a lot of pressure so but i took the stand the I pressure on you to which, which truth are you talking about i'm now? talking about when we are talking the about the inx case ah, yeah so okay. there was i was under a lot of pressure you know so uh you know there are documents so whether i say it or i don't say it you know there are signatures there are documents So I do believe uh, very honestly Smita that there is you know a much bigger game to this whole thing and I think uh, we were just pawns and that's it. We and uh, uh, we means definitely me and I think uh, sometimes and these are all again opinions in my own thinking I think uh, Peter also got kind of you know caught in this whole thing by for being too smart about it i think all he needed to do was the day i was arrested just do everything possible to get me out that was it which i think just in you know somehow it didn't fly with people that can was, i ask you if you're in touch with him again i mean you don't yes. have to answer if you don't want to no i am in touch in the sense i meet him in court hmm. and i would like to ask him a lot of questions you know which I did ask him several questions as and when uh I have met him in court he does not have answers to those questions and I never think he will have I don't think he'll ever have answers but in my heart I know now so I don't I don't think he can ever answer those questions ever He's had a messed up uh life too with his first marriage uh goes for a toss then he tries to reconnect with her even though he's married to you and then his two sons live abroad um and he's had and a he's, a relationship in between that hmm. uh, for almost 12 years hmm. so it's not that you know so peter was single for not single peter was with somebody else and then single when i met him so for almost 12 years so it's been it's, i mean it's a bit messy anyway you you speak so. in your book uh, very affectionately about your younger daughter vidhi even though the yes. older one you had a a, a strange relationship which is understandable considering the circumstances circumstances uh, with vidhi you've had a warmth uh, all through she comes to see you in court and she she asks for help but at the same time she knows that for survival she needs to be with her father's yes. side of the family because there's nobody in the mother's side of the family and that's a young correct. girl correct now all your children battle with substance abuse because of traumas at different parts of time you didn't no i never did There i've been, never been you've been very very i think strong and just to put it on record i don't drink i don't smoke forget about substance abuse yeah. no i used to drink earlier but i've never at no point yeah. ever even i've never smoked a cigarette so yeah. i'm just letting you know so but you, i i don't drink and yeah. so uh, for those people who who yeah. think that it's you know that's an option just you know the hard life that indrani is led she hasn't uh, succumbed to that pressure but you are understanding about the reasons why they have at some point of time and you reach across 
Vidhi, uh, in the introduction, if I'm not mistaken, you said that somewhere you just shut yourself even from Vidhi. And you said, I just want to be on my own now. Uh, see, I don't shut myself uh, from anyone even now. But I think I uh, have no expectations from anyone. There's a difference. I am still there for like, I felt, not I felt, my father wronged me. I don't feel that he has wronged me. And I would not say use such strong words as far as my mother goes as being wronged. But yes, she could have been uh, stronger and she should have stood by me. But bygones are bygones. But when they reached out to me and they needed my support, I was there for them. When you rebuilt the house and yeah, things. It's like that and, I, I, and I took care of them till the end. I was the one who went out even when they passed away. I to court permission and I went and did the shrad so that I I mean that was the day I think I truly forgive my father the day I did his shrad and I wanted his soul to rest in peace and that was that but mm, you did I, the shrad in Bombay even. yes yes yeah. I did the shrad in Bombay and um, I would like to again put it on record that whether it is um, Peter or whether it is, I've of course been very, I felt very hurt even by my son, Mikhail. But if tomorrow any of them were to need me and they were in trouble and I was in a position to help them, I would. So if tomorrow if Peter is sick and, uh, you know, there's nobody to look after him, I would still do it. I would still do it because... Don't you realize, Indrani, I mean, I'm sitting from the outside. I shouldn't yeah, be judging you. Yeah. But don't you see that? That that's what has led to all your troubles in life. Where yeah, but I am you, who I am. Anybody reaches out to you, yeah. even if you're wronged, you jump in to help or you jump in into that relationship or, or whatever it is. And then again, there's trouble. Yeah, but that is life, isn't it? I mean... Two things, you know, change is the only constant in life. And if we, when we use big words like empathy and forgiveness, I think we all need to learn to, you know, walk the talk. Otherwise, it's pointless, right? So I think I am a person who would still, still, of course, I am detached. I have no expectations. You know, when... Vidhi, re, Vidhi filed an application in court to say, I want to go and live with my mother. And similarly, tomorrow, you know, you never know when tables turn with anybody. Every dog has its day, right? Mm -hmm. So, and it is, I would not but gloat if somebody reaches out to me, whoever it is. A lot of people have wronged me knowingly or unknowingly or in the circumstances they were in. But uh, I think, you know, I have made also, and I know what it is, you know, to feel like when you're abandoned and when you have nobody really supporting you. I know nobody knows or understands this better than me. So I do believe that if somebody swallows his or her pride and is able to reach out to me despite, you know, being unfair to me, then I think me... Turning my back on them would be a very inhuman act. What I about so. those people who went on television? Did any of them contact you once you came out on bail? No. Nobody. <laughs> Nobody's contacted you me. you regret not having that life again which you had in Bombay? All those parties that you went to, the celebrities that you met, you don't want to go back to that again? Or no, do you I still, miss it? Uh, no, I don't miss it. Actually, I do have a very good set of friends and a lot of people... I don't have shallow friends now. That's the difference. You know, I have a lot of friends uh, who are not necessarily out there on everybody's faces, but they are from all types of backgrounds, whether they are from extremely privileged backgrounds or, uh, you know, they have to worry about, you know, two square meals a day. So I have friends from different walks of life now and they are very, very interesting people and they are very, very genuine people, you know. And your so, battle continues, right, Indrani? It's not all over as yet. Oh, absolutely not. Because I think that is going to 
continue all my life you know it is not easy to be in rani mukherjee i can tell you no no that. it isn't <laughs> after reading so, that book it's not yeah, yeah it is not easy but also i would not want to be anybody else but be in rani because not everybody yeah. is as strong as in rani mukherjee and i think you know one message out to everybody like oh, is that you need to believe in yourself before believing in anyone else i mean there have been uh, people so it is of course uh, like people went on record to say and this is really funny you know and now i laugh about it like for example why i colored my hair and the funny part is all these anchors are in their 50s and 70s who really have a big debate about why i'm coloring my hair but they are of course evergreen right mm. they don't have a single gray hair on their head right but you so, realize why it's it funny was, you know it's because you were this glamorous person who led this fabulous life and then I you come i still lead a fabulous <laughs> life <laughs> and i still i continue to the lead MD. a fabulous life sure. even when i was in Absolutely. prison so that's okay that what, was the problem I, when i meant fabulous what i meant yeah. to say is that many people would look at that life and say that you know like it's like when deepika padukone came out and talked about depression yeah. uh, people i knew my aunts and everybody around me and i said how can deepika such a beautiful yes. successful person be depressed be depressed yeah. so uh, so that's what happened when you came out of jail with the white hair which is like oh my god look what she's become uh, that happened and then when you came out with colored hair it was like oh okay p you actually get uh, so you're damned if you do it you're damned, damned if you don't that's so when thing. you came yeah. out it's like oh okay she's appealing to sympathy by wearing salwar kameez as compared to the pardon my language because it's a podcast i can say it the sexy sarees and blouses yeah. that you were wearing yeah. and you had an you had an aura about you indrani and then Thank you, you come out of uh, jail and you know everybody was like oh my god this is the de glamorize so there were some people who were actually you know oh, okay there is a de glamorized version of indrani too yeah. so there was that too that envy translating into those horns which yeah, came, out. came out you know the thing is the first few months you know till i realized obviously that you know it's a bogus chart sheet <laughs> till i realized that completely that there were so many loopholes see i was also dealing with uh, multiple emotions one is obviously the grief of perhaps having lost a child the other is abandonment so it was never really uh, the creature comforts which bothered me honestly it didn't in fact you get used to that very quickly you know very very quickly mm. and unlike what uh, people think that i have a lot of needs and i'm very desirous of creature comforts i am actually not having a successful career does not equate to always wanting good things in life or wanting a life of luxury okay so i think people are very confused about what ambition is and what greed is so ambition doesn't equate to greed as being a good mother or a bad mother doesn't equate to being a murderer okay so i think people need to differentiate between the two so for me adjusting uh, you know having to sleep on a floor or i have always been a very small eater no so shower just a bucket and just mug. a bucket and in you fact the that. first day when i went into prison i was looking for a flush you know i didn't know i said oh my god now there's no flush so but you get used to all those things you know over a period and it takes very little time but It 2460 days, days as an under trial yes so that is no i i will just finish my part about my hair because hair. that is a very a, that has been like there have been debates about it uh, tv debates thing, uh, yes tv debates and really seriously that was a tv debate i couldn't even believe it but anyway and in multiple channels so uh, i actually did not see hair colors and mehndi all of that was kajals all these things are available in prison right it's not a torture chamber it's a holding house mm. so uh, all of that was available but i could not bring myself really to go and 
really groom myself at that point because I was the trauma. Yeah, yeah, the trauma I felt. But mm. when I collected myself and I brought myself, you know, put my pieces together, I needed also to feel good about. Unlike what people like to believe that you don't always color your hair or you wear lipstick or kajal or you dress up. to lure people you do it for yourself mm. and 90% of the women i think just do it just sure. to feel good yeah. that is what i think smita you do i do yeah. and lot of women do which i think people need to understand that and also it is not a criminal offense to feel good about yourself you know mm. so that also is so people actually forgot about the case it was about what i in fact one day to court i wore a white salwar kameez and uh, one very senior journalist you would know about it i don't want to take the name right now wrote a column oh my god she must have got a designer to get that white salwar kameez designed for the occasion to come out and uh, it was just a very cheap lucknowi kurta and pajama which mm. must have costed 500 bucks anyway but it's good i mean whatever i wear gets labeled as designer even in prison but okay so yeah. that was the thing so two days later i went to court in a pair of jeans and a shirt and another journalist wrote that oh my god she's dressed up so casually as if she's going to go to the kalaghora festival oops so it is like like i said you're no damned way. yeah it's so i realized that i don't need to please anyone i shall wear exactly what i feel like and i did that in prison and you uh, you got admitted to a hospital yes. also and yes, then there were uh, write ups which said that you attempted suicide uh, you had i i would well understand that the trauma would induce anybody to want to just end it all end it all see But i'll be very honest with you smita that there were on several occasions i would just not wait want to wake up in the mornings because or when i wake up at when i go to sleep i would want to believe that it's one big nightmare which would end but that particular incident that happened again is very 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 strange and uh, you know sometimes it gets me to also feel that I don't think uh you know when I went into prison firstly well I lost a lot of weight because I couldn't eat I couldn't not because the food was bad it was not because of that but it was you know the overall trauma and everything I lost almost 18 20 kg but not because of my creature comforts again <laughs> but uh, because of what I was going through emotionally but uh, I still survived and a month later I was unconscious and in prison until and unless uh you know you find some other means that you go and cut your wrist or go and hang yourself you cannot cannot just become unconscious because any form of medication that is given to any prisoner is given under proper supervision mm. so that was something very of course I was diagnosed with something very very different I was diagnosed with a blockage in my brain that mm. is what had actually happened but stories are stories mm. so there was this whole story of overdose and this and that which of course didn't come out in the reports mm. but there were another story other stories that spun out of it but the actual cause was which came out on my medical reports and i have actually stopped the treatment now finally in the last 6 months the clot has because there was a clot in my brain that is what had happened and so i was in blood thinners for a very very long time up until almost 6 months ago so now i am all right and post that also i had symptoms of a brain stroke much later mm. and i had a facial paralysis and all of that so i went so it is kind of it's man- manifested physiologically too yes it was actually that to be very honest it mm-hmm. was that but then again of course that was a piece of spicy reporting that happened and uh, but it's all right you're always in the media i in conclusion yeah. uh, indrani i just yeah. want to ask you are you searching for sheena or do you want that to be not your job to do no i am searching for her of course i am and i am doing it in my own way 
and at the there is already a lot of evidence on record which i said which definitely establishes already that she was she was alive after that alleged death date of whatever deaths or missing going missing i cannot say for sure what is the status right now i'm using the term status because it's very painful to use any other word right now i hope she is alive i hope she's fine and safe wherever she is and if she has whatever constraint she has she needs to know that she will be well protected if she's under any form of pressure that she cannot come out but my search for her is not going to end it is not going to end i couldn't do it earlier and till i was behind bars but i have started it and this time when somebody came and told me when i was behind bars all i could do was write to the authorities but nobody did anything right for months till i had to again go to court it was too late because we could have retrieved cctv footage the lady the police officer was willing to go and show the spot but nobody did anything it's perhaps you know the system mm. or what it is i don't know but uh, this time i did not take a chance when somebody came and told me immediately you know i i did everything that i could and yes i am doing my own search in my own way whatever i can i cannot talk about it right now i am not legally authorized to conduct an investigation because i am you know not an investigating agency but no i shall never give up the search no i will not all the best to you Thank hope you. you find closure in in all the troubles that you happen uh, that have happened to you and more strength to you thank you so much smita uh, you know as far as uh, closure goes i think uh, emotional closure i have found by writing this book because all my life i have been baptized by fire you know yeah and that has made me a stronger person uh but at the same time uh i do believe that in our lives in different degrees we will always have challenges just that we need to believe in ourselves and i think i also do believe that there is a god above and there is karma and karma is the hero without a cape and there is justice and last but not the least okay this book hmm. is not my version this book is the truth and there is only one truth there cannot be two truths there cannot be half truths and i also want to put it on record that i'm i'm very very thankful that harper collins has published this book but we went to have written this entire book in prison they've had the courage to publish this book but there has been a legal validation and we have gone through an entire process of legal ratification and validation for over a period of 6 months before we put this out to print and which is why on the footnotes you know i have put all the links hmm. wherever possible and i have taken every question asked by every single journalist on the chin because i know i can give answers hmm. looking into the eye of the journalist as well as the camera you're not a shrinking violet and you shouldn't be uh, no you. woman should be Thank you. i don't believe uh, that anybody i mean of course everybody would want you to play the role of a grieving uh, mother all your life and uh, or, or i am a, grieving and, inside yeah. i am grieving no, for several things yeah if yeah. you know i mean you have grieving inside is a different matter yes. because of the life that you have led but the role of a uh, grieving if you know what i mean yes. like you know yes. the Uh, not coloring your hair like you mentioned is one of the things that is expected out of somebody grieving the loss of a uh, loved one but then you have decided i do not believe that i have lost her yeah. 
I will find her. Yes, I wish you success in that. Thank I you. hope that wherever Sheena is, if she's alive, that she reaches across to you and you find uh, some kind of a solution to the problem yes. that you're going through. Yes. All the best. Thank you thank so you. much, thank Smita. So much. It's Thanks. been a pleasure speaking with you. Thank you. And uh, thank you for discussing the book and the bringing book. out parts which would kind of otherwise perhaps you know, not have come out mm. to this degree. So thank you so much. Thank you. That was a difficult conversation with a murder accused. Thank you for watching or listening in to this edition of ANI Podcast with Smita Prakash. Do like or subscribe on whichever channel you have seen this or heard this. Namaste. Jai Hind. Click here to watch the previous episodes.